This is the second meeting of the Gonzaga Socratic Club for spring semester. Glad to see you're here. Uh, the Socratic Club is inspired by the Oxford Socratic Club that was presided over by C.S. Lewis in the mid-1900s at Oxford. And like the Oxford version of the club, we deal with topics in Christian worldview from a broadly philosophical theme, uh, from a broadly philosophical approach, things like the problem of evil or religious pluralism, or our topic for today, which is religious skepticism. Our speaker today is a colleague from up the road at Whitworth University in the philosophy department, Nathan King, is from the Pacific Northwest originally, was an undergraduate at Seattle Pacific, and uh, then got an MA degree in philosophy from Biola University, and then went on to uh, Notre Dame for his PhD work. He's been at Whitworth since 2010. So, uh, and he's been to the Crab Club before, so it's nice to have Nathan back here. Uh, he'll be speaking on the topic of religious disagreement. What do we do? Uh, what, uh, what can a theist do? What off arguments can a theist offer uh, regarding the fact that people disagree about religious beliefs? So let's welcome Nathan Kimball. Thanks, David, and uh, thank you all for coming. So today I'm going to present uh, part of a paper that's really part of a longer one. And that longer paper examined two arguments for religious skepticism. The first one is uh, what I call an argument from peer disagreement, and the second is a cumulative argument from what I'll call higher order evidence. You'll see that defined on your handout. Higher order evidence is basically evidence about our evidence or about our capacities for or performance in responding to our evidence. In the longer paper, I aim to show that the first argument, the peers-based argument, is unsound, but that the second argument, the cumulative one, is more promising for the religious skeptic. I won't defend the claim that the first argument is unsound today. I'll focus on the second argument. I won't be endorsing that argument. Uh, rather, I'll be submitting it as worthy of consideration. I'll do my best to defend it, and I'll do my best to reply to it. At least in some moods, I find the argument formidable. That is, at least in some moods, it tempts me to suspend judgment uh, about my religious beliefs. But for all of that, I don't consider myself a religious skeptic. Um, in fact, I'm going to close the paper by examining some ways uh, a believer might resist the argument. The best of these replies, I'm going to suggest, points us to some ways in which discussions of religious disagreement actually point away from themselves and toward other topics. All right, in the current discussion of disagreements, there's a near consensus that higher order evidence matters. That is, it can affect the epistemic status of our first order beliefs. So for instance, learning about disagreement can affect one's belief about God. By way of preview, the cumulative argument I'm going to discuss goes like this. First, uh, there's not just one sort of higher order evidence that's relevant to the epistemic status of religious belief. Rather, there are several. It's plausible that taken individually, these types of evidence mandate at least some reduction in confidence in religious belief. Uh, but these individual bits of higher order evidence may not mandate significant, significant confidence reduction all on their own. However, as they're accumulated, Significant, significant confidence reduction seems more and more appropriate, and maybe even mandatory. Thus, if religious believers are aware of such evidence, they might, they might find themselves with unjustified beliefs. It's the attempt to accumulate higher order evidence that makes the present argument different from other skeptical arguments on offer. Other arguments focus on one kind of higher order evidence, for instance, evidence of peer disagreements, and aim to vindicate skepticism by appeal to that single factor. By contrast, the argument developed here appeals to several different types of higher order evidence. Some of these become salient as a result of disagreements, while others need not involve disagreement. So what I'm going to do now is unfold sort of the first stage of the argument. That's going to consist in spelling out uh, what those individual bits of higher order evidence amount to, and then making sort of judgments about uh, their, uh, their epistemic weight, sort of initial judgments. So start with what I've called HE1. Something's wrong with most of us. There are billions of people in the world who hold religious beliefs. 
And many, many of these beliefs and their corresponding belief systems are incompatible with many of the others. At most, one of these belief systems is entirely correct. Most of them contain false beliefs, perhaps many or mostly false beliefs. It follows that most people who hold religious beliefs either have misleading evidence or have assessed non-misleading evidence irrationally. Plausibly, many, many of these people are intelligent and well-meaning. When I realize that I'm among these billions of people, how should I react? Granted, it doesn't follow from the fact that most people have false religious beliefs, that my religious beliefs are false. And granted, there are myriad ways of assessing evidence among these billions of people. So maybe there's not some one belief forming process, say, uh, religious belief formation, that I can figure as unreliable. But I need to know exactly what's wrong with most of us in order to know that something is wrong. Something clearly is wrong, whether due to irrationality or misleading evidence, we need to know which. Many of us have false beliefs about the relevant subject matter, and this seems at least somewhat worrisome, even if we can't identify what the problem is. So now, to compare the following case. Suppose you go into the doctor's office for some kind of routine tests. You go back into the waiting room, there are five other people there. And after a few minutes, the doctor comes out and just sort of informs all of you at once. Yeah, and five of you are going to be dead within two weeks of some dread disease. The doctor, so this is not very nice, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so, he doesn't tell you what the disease is, and he doesn't tell you which of you have it. You all say you feel fine. Well, under that kind of condition, it seems like you ought to be at least a little more worried about your health than you were before the doctor came into the room. Um, and I think in the case of religious belief, uh, learning about the kind of higher order evidence I just countenanced, is analogous. We ought to be at least a little more worried than we were before we learned about that higher order evidence. Um, to kind of press this a little more, um, just kind of test case, I'd be really relieved if all in one day, maybe next April 1st, all of the proponents of the world's great religions that are incompatible with my beliefs suddenly announced, oh yeah, we're just kidding. Um, we held beliefs compatible with yours all along. Right? That, that would bring some relief to me. Um, that suggests, I think, that learning about all this religious diversity counts for at least something. Learning that there's something wrong with all of us, or many of us, counts for at least something. Uh, so I ought to reduce my confidence at least a bit. Here's a second piece of higher order evidence, called it difficulty in assessments. Many of the relevant grounds for religious belief are difficult to assess. Some of these grounds are arguments for religious beliefs, and arguments can be hard to assess. As Pascal once said, the metaphysical proofs for the existence of God are so remote from human reasoning and so involved that they make little impact. And even if they did help some people, it would only be for the moment during which they watched the demonstration, because an hour later they would be afraid they'd made a mistake. Um, and notice that effect gets even worse when we start talking about cumulative cases for religious beliefs rather than single arguments. And what goes for the arguments for God's existence goes for the arguments against, and for the arguments for various other religious belief systems. Such arguments always involve inferences, so deductive inferences, probabilistic inferences, inferences to the best explanation, um, the weighing of explanatory criteria, and so on. Even good thinkers sometimes make mistakes in assessing arguments like this. And the more complicated the arguments, the more likely mistakes become. Well, how should we assess this sort of higher order evidence? Well, I can already hear sort of the reformed epistemologists, uh, among whom I sometimes count myself, I can already hear them saying, look, belief in God need to be based on an argument, so we don't have to worry about the fact that the arguments are difficult to assess. Well, so far, so good. But notice that one's belief isn't based on a positive argument for one's view. It doesn't entail that one can ignore the higher order evidence just described. For at least if one is a typical reflective religious person, one will have encountered arguments against one's religious views. And these arguments are relevant to assessing the epistemic status of religious belief. Properly basic beliefs aren't indefeasible, in other words. And our new kind of higher order evidence enters the fray precisely as a potential defeater. To speak again in the first person, I do take myself to have reasoned well in rejecting, for instance, those versions of the argument from evil uh, for atheism that I've come across. But some of these arguments are very subtle. 
They involve fine-grained distinctions and delicate inferences, and have to help us base factor analyses. Further, with, with respect to some of these arguments, my initial rejection involved the philosophical skills of a beginner, right? my past self. Even today, when I revisit the arguments, I still think there's at least some positive probability that I make a mistake when I reject them. In light of this, it seems I should downgrade my confidence in my religious beliefs, at least a bit. For though I think I have adequate responses to the above-mentioned atheological arguments, I'm not entirely sure of this. I'm even less sure in light of the following piece of higher-order evidence, called an HE3, Disagreement About Assessment. With respect to some religiously relevant bits of publicly shareable first-order evidence, for instance, arguments, there's widespread disagreement about the force of that evidence. Among those who hold incompatible views about the force of that evidence, there seem to be many, many intelligent, well-meaning people. And further, among those who disagree with me are a few geniuses, people who, in the words of Brian Francis, could kick my philosophical ass. <laughs> this kind of evidence is similar to the higher-order evidence discussed in the pure disagreement literature. But there are important differences. Disagreement over assessment is just described concerns only discrete bits of evidence, so individual arguments, that are much easier for subjects to share than large collective bodies of evidence. Further, having this sort of higher order evidence doesn't require an implausible degree of access to the contents and workings of other minds. In a longer paper, I argue that the assumption of peer disagreement does require that, that negative that result. Uh, we need only know that there's some evidential overlap between us and our dissenters, uh, for my kind of and that many of these folks are smart and earnest. Finally, the higher order evidence just sketched appeals to the fact that many people who hold views incompatible with one's own are aware of at least some of one's evidence. To suppose this is no less plausible than supposing, for instance, that many of one's dissenters have read some of the same books and articles that one's read. Well, let's make a, an initial judgment about the force of this kind of evidence. Um, how much force does it have? The answer depends, I think, on a person's total epistemic situation. Uh, so again, I can speak most knowledgeably of my own, so here goes. I don't take my primary grounds for religious belief to consist in arguments. So I'm not terribly worried that certain non-believers, for instance, J.L. Mackey, Davids, Hume, and Lewis, think lowly of the arguments for theism. I'm somewhat more worried about the fact that Mackey and Hume and Lewis think that cer certain arguments of which I'm aware are strong arguments for atheism. I'm not extremely worried about this, as I often think I can see at least one flaw in the atheistic arguments I'm aware of. So I don't find myself tempted in the face of disagreement over assessment to move to atheism or even to agnosticism. Instead, I find myself compelled just to be a little bit more circumspect in my beliefs than I'd otherwise be. And if your situation is like mine, maybe you'll think similarly. Next, consider HE4. Uh, there's a lot out there. So my discussion of this owes uh, quite a bit to Nathan Ballantyne. He's a professor at Fordham University, a friend of Charlie's, and it's important to acknowledge that. Uh, so here goes with respect to HE4. Uh, when it comes to our religious beliefs, few of us have more than a sliver of the total relevant epistemic grounds uh, that are available to human subjects, generally speaking. Some of us have had significant religious experiences, and we have those as grounds. And we have a smattering of relevant arguments, intuitions, testimonies, and so on. But in reflective moments, we realize that there's a mountain of epistemic grounds, arguments, experiences, and so on, that we don't have. Of course, we can't have others' religious experiences, so we don't have them. Perhaps we need to account for those grounds, but we don't really feel guilty for not having them. By contrast, we may well feel guilty when we consider the thousands of pages of relevant books and articles that sit unread on our shelves or in the university library. So we say to ourselves things like, I should have read that. Or, um, you know, I forgot the main argument of that article. Or, after I get tenure, I'll read those books. Or, if I only had a 2-2 teaching load, I'd read those articles. Right? And, and so on. When we think about it, it seems likely that there are many potential epistemic grounds that are available and relevant to our beliefs, but are such that we don't have them. Some of these are surely grounds that point away from the truth of our beliefs. When we realize all this, it might occur to us to ask, 
whether we have good reason to think that our grounds are representative of the total available grounds. To the extent that we have reason to doubt that our grounds are representative, it seems we have reason to downgrade our confidence in our religious beliefs, or maybe more modestly. If uh, we accord some positive probability to the claim that our grounds for belief aren't representative of the total grounds available, then we should downgrade our confidence at least somewhat. At any rate, I'm not comfortable downgrading all the grounds I don't have, at least some of which surely support beliefs incompatible with mine, um, as though they carry no epistemic weight. The higher order evidence that there are such grounds seems to count for something. So again, I'd be relieved if next April Fool's Day someone took me to the university library and we went through all those books that I think <laughs> are arguing against my view and found that they were filled with blank pages or, you know, Garfield comics or something. But they're probably not, right? So it seems uh, I had to downgrade my confidence at least a smidgen. There are other relevant kinds of higher order evidence uh, that I won't go into today. Uh, for instance, it, it's at least a live possibility that many of us have formed our religious beliefs on the basis of wish fulfillment, or maybe in the atheist case, on the basis of some kind of divine authority problem. So, you know, pick your poison there. Um, and it seems that for many of us, if we've been born elsewhere and elsewhere, we believe differently than we in fact do. Um, call that last bit of evidence, HE5. A complete rendering of the cumulative argument from higher order evidence would account for these additional varieties of evidence. It would go into more detail about the ones I've already countenanced, uh, but, but for our purposes, uh, what we've done already will have to do. It seems plausible that each of these bits of higher order evidence provides at least some reason to downgrade our confidence in our religious beliefs. And here's the thought, when these bits of evidence are combined, maybe substantial reason for downgrading our confidence. Okay, so there's the first stage of the argument, and now we'll state it more explicitly. So let HE star be the sum of the higher order evidence packed into HE1 through HE5. HE star, for our purposes, is higher order evidence relevant to some religious belief that P, maybe pick one of your own religious beliefs and put it in there for P, um, and S is the subject who believes P. <coughs> we can now set out the argument. Premise one, if S is justified in believing P on grounds G, and becomes aware of HE star, then S is not justified in believing P. Step two, many religious believers are justified in their religious beliefs on the basis of certain grounds and are aware of HE star. Uh, conclusion, many religious believers are not justified in their religious beliefs. Uh, the argument's valid, and step two seems plausible, at least with respect to many reflective believers. Every religious believer in this room, for instance, presumably has some grounds for his or her <coughs> religious beliefs and is aware of HE star, or something very much like it. So, uh, that might be my fault, um, so sorry. Um, if we hold religious beliefs and also attend meetings of the Society of Christian Philosophers, the APA, the Gonzaga Socratic Club, and if we read around in the literature, in the philosophy of religion, teach classes on the topic, or attend classes on the topic, then we know that many religious beliefs must be false, and that the evaluation of religious claims is difficult and fraught with disagreement, and that we only have a slice of the available grounds, and so on. So step two seems plausible. Uh, we'll then focus on, and uh, might not we'll focus on step one. I think that's probably where most of the action is. One is an epistemic principle. It says, in effect, that H.E. Starr removes the epistemic efficacy of the religious believer's grounds, whatever they are, sort of a, a universal solvent. Uh, why I think this is right, so this is me arguing on behalf of the skeptic here. Uh, the first thing to note is that for each of the subcomponents of HE star, formidable philosophers have argued that those individual subcomponents by themselves remove the epistemic efficacy of a belief's grounds. So we have arguments in the literature from apparent unreliability, difficulty in assessment, disagreement over assessment, evidence we don't have, evidence of non-rational contingencies in belief formation, and so on. Premise one packs all of these considerations into its antecedent. And plausibly, this makes the antecedent less vulnerable to counterexamples than principles appealing only to a single bit of higher order evidence. Second, when someone believes P on grounds G and acquires HE star, one arguably acquires a defeater for the belief that P. 
Why is this? Well, in acquiring a G star, one will question whether G is a reliable indicator that P. Or if one doesn't actually uh, question this, one will acquire reason to do so. In light of HE star, one will either disbelieve or withhold with respect to whether G reliably indicates P, or one will acquire reason to disbelieve or with respect to this. Now, I'm going to argue for this in more detail as we go, but if any of these conditions obtain, and if that conjunction, right, the initial grounds and HE star, are all the believer has to go on, then that believer will have a defeater uh, for the belief of P. And this won't be justified in believing in P. Alright, so now let's take these conditions one by one. Start with someone who disbelieves that the conjunction G and HE star supports P. Suppose my belief that P is otherwise justified. But then suppose, in light of HE star, I come to disbelieve that my grounds for believing P reliably indicate its truth. In these circumstances, my belief that P is defeated. So I'm like someone who forms justified beliefs about the temperature outside, right? Oh, it's 75 degrees. And then subsequently comes to believe um, my thermometer is unreliable. It's unlikely, given that it reads what it does, that the temperature is what it says it is. Um, if I'm in that kind of situation, I have what's called a believed defeater for P. Where a believed defeater is a doxastic attitude of mind, uh, so belief, disbelief, withholding, that removes the justification of the target belief, at least unless I have some other support for that target belief other than uh, the initial grounds of G. All right, next, suppose I withhold with respect to whether G and HE star supports P. This also seems to give me a defeater for P. For if I withhold with respect to this, my position is like that of someone who forms justified temperature beliefs by looking at a thermometer and who subsequently withholds belief in the thermometer's reliability. So I look at the thermometer, it says 75 degrees, and then I think, I have no idea whether this thermometer is reliable. Well, uh, the belief that the thermometer uh, correctly records 75 degrees is then defeated. Withholding at the higher level defeats the lower level of temperature belief. And likewise, for my belief that P, so to make it my belief in God or whatever, if I withhold on whether my grounds, G and HG star, support P. At least provided that G and HG star are all I have to go on, I get a belief defeater for my belief. If believed defeaters are actually defeaters, then we have two ways for HE star to defeat the belief that P. And I suspect that lots of religious believers acquire defeaters on acquiring evidence like HE star in this way. They just think to themselves, um, irrespective of whether they have reason to think this, they just think to themselves, even given my grounds for belief in God, could that belief really be right in light of this huge, jumbled, ambiguous pile of evidence that I see in HE star? Um, given all of that evidence, my belief is probably wrong, or at any rate, I have no idea whether it's right. The believer who sincerely performs that sort of speech to herself has a defeater uh, for her religious beliefs, a believed defeater. Okay. But now suppose I don't disbelieve or withhold with respect to whether my grounds and HE star, that conjunction, supports my belief in P. Suppose I believe that those grounds, even the conjunction, supports that proposition. I think to myself something like this. Well, I'm not sure about all the details in HE star, but I am sure that at the end of the day, those uh, grounds and belief um, G, I'm uh, sorry, those grounds G for belief that P conjoined with HE star, that conjunction is still going to support my religious belief. Suppose I perform that speech for my, before myself, um, does that save my belief for defeat? Well, I want to say, not automatically. <clears throat> for even if I continue to believe that G supports P, HE star may give me justification a reason for disbelieving or withholding with respect to that proposition. And if I would be justified in disbelieving or withholding with respect to whether G and HE star reliably indicates P, then I have a defeater for my belief that P, even if I continue to think this belief is well supported. All right. This is, I think, the sort of the hairiest part of the paper we'll be through shortly. Uh, the crucial question uh, then is, does acquiring HE star give someone reason to withhold or disbelieve with respect to whether G reliably indicates P. Well, let's start with disbelief. Suppose someone is aware of HE star and is considering whether G reliably indicates P. Given all the higher order evidence packed into HE star, one can begin to see the plausibility of the claim that P isn't very likely on one's evidence. For one is aware that human subjects, generally speaking, 
are largely failing to get at the truth regarding P. And one's aware that in light of all the relevant arguments pro and con, claims like P are notoriously hard to assess. Further, and maybe because of this difficulty, there's pervasive disagreement about the force of the relevant arguments. Still worse, one's aware that many of the grounds relevant to assessing P are grounds that one doesn't have. So G is just a sliver of what's available. And one's also aware that if one had been born elsewhere and elsewhere, one either wouldn't have G, wouldn't have those grounds, or would have been disposed to assess them differently. In light of all this, one might understandably, justifiably, disbelieve that her total grounds support the, uh, the idea that G and HE star support P. She might think to herself quite sensibly, right, given this mountainous heap of evidence involved in HE star, G isn't a very reliable indicator of the truth of P. Maybe there's something wrong with this way of thinking. It seems, I think, at least initially plausible, at least worthy of consideration. And we could repeat the similar line of thought with respect to reasons for withholding on whether G and H star supports P. If the intuitions uh, in either case are correct, then religious believers who acquire H E star have a defeater for their religious beliefs, uh, despite these beliefs enjoying prima facie justification by way of their initial grounds. Uh, and this is so even if the subjects continue to believe that the conjunction G and H E star supports their religious beliefs. Subjects in that position aren't justified in believing the G and the G star supports P, and so they aren't justified in their religious beliefs, just as premise one of the q and argument says. All right, so now I want to do some uh, consideration of ways of evaluating the argument. I'm going to consider three replies that strike me as inadequate in one way or another. They, they at any rate, don't give the re religious believer all she wants. And then I'm going to close by discussing a reply that I think uh, stands a bit better chance. So the first objection capitalizes on a limiting feature of the cumulative skeptical argument. And it's this. Even if it justifies significant belief relief, relief revision for the believer, it does so only for the reflective <laughs> religious believer. Uh, so maybe only philosophy nerds and theologians uh, even stop to consider the kind of evidence packed into H.G. E. Star. And if that's right, then premise two of the argument is going to seem questionable. I'm not going to pursue this line of thought further because it's of no use to anyone who's still listening. Right? So if you're still listening, <laughs> you're, you're, you're on the hook. Um, all right, so a second objection aims to level the playing field like this. If the cumulative skeptical argument highlights a reason to doubt that one's first order grounds support religious belief, it also provides reason to ground, uh, excuse me, reason to doubt that withholding is the correct response to one's uh, first order grounds. It's therefore a challenge to the believer and the skeptic alike. So now suppose I'm a religious skeptic. I'll likely be aware that many people hold religious beliefs and disbeliefs. Granted, many of them are wrong. Many of them have misleading evidence or are making mistakes in assessing their evidence or whatever. Um, but then why not think that in my skepticism I've fallen into one of these malign circumstances? Likewise, if I'm a skeptic, it seems I should think that perhaps I fail to appreciate the force of theistic and atheological arguments. For example, with respect to those arguments I share with the theist, um, there's at least a minuscule probability that I fail to appreciate genuine grounds for religious belief. Finally, reflection on grounds I don't have shows me that my epistemic base is really pretty paltry. In light of all this, how can I reasonably be sure that suspension of judgment is the correct attitude for me to take? And I want to suggest there's, there's something right about this reply to the skeptic. But I also want to suggest that it doesn't give the believer all she might want. So maybe this reply is effective dialectically. Um, it sort of puts the skeptic on the hook too. But what it doesn't do is help the believer explain how her beliefs could be rational in the face of all this higher order evidence. Um, and I'm going to suggest a response in a few minutes that I think fares at least a bit better with respect to that. The third objection is related to the second. Doesn't the cumulative argument from higher order evidence undermine not just religious beliefs, but also beliefs about ethics and politics and science and philosophy? And isn't the conclusion that our beliefs in all these fields? So, so far, we've treated the grounds for religious beliefs and the beliefs themselves in the abstract. We've been considering, in effect, 
whether HE star is a kind of universal solvent that eats away at the justification of any belief it comes into contact with. But if we're to determine rigorously the defeating force of HE star, we'll need to consider several more concrete details. As the discussion to follow illustrates, these detail details can make large differences in how HE star affects a belief's epistemic status. So first, on more than one plausible account, what attitude it is reasonable to take in light of newly acquired or higher order evidence will depend on the strength of one's initial grounds for one's religious beliefs. If one's initial grounds provide only moderate support, so maybe you know, one's initial um, arguments for God's existence or religious experiences make belief just barely more rational than withholding, well then, it looks like H.E. Starr might make uh, the move toward agnosticism more plausible, maybe even mandatory. But if one's initial grounds are very strong, HE star may not have that effect. If higher order evidence like HE star is to be a defeater, a universal defeater, for even well justified religious beliefs, it'll need to mandate a very significant reduction in confidence, even in well justified beliefs. So, more on whether it does that. Second, in considering to what extent a religious belief is disconfirmed by HE star, we're in effect asking. How likely is it that P, right, one's religious belief is true, given HE star? That is, we're asking for the conditional probability of P on HE star. And to determine that, we'll need to determine the likelihood of the subjects having HE star if a religious belief is true, and we'll need to determine the likelihood of her having HE star if a belief is false. In other words, we need to consider the relative explanatory power of P, the target belief, and its negation with respect to HE star. Okay, so the remaining discussion will be set out in a Bayesian framework. I think that'll facilitate clarity about the points to be made. I think the substantive points can be made without that framework. So if you're not a big fan of Bayesianism, don't worry, uh, the, the point uh, doesn't rely on the framework, crucially. All right, let G, uh, the believer's initial grounds, set the prior probability of her belief these grounds may be arguments, religious experiences, or something else. It's not going to matter much for our purposes. And for the sake of concreteness, let the target belief be theism. That is, T, the belief that there exists an omnipotent, omniscient, holy good God who created the world. In keeping with what skeptics are typically willing to grant, let's set T's prior probability high. So let's set it, say, at 0.9. To be sure, some religious believers will think this value is too low while some skeptics will think it's too high. Believers who are dissatisfied with the probability of assignment are invited to substitute their own. And they can see the following exercise as a kind of worst case scenario <coughs> for their beliefs. Skeptics who are dissatisfied with the probability of assignment, but who want to advance the cumulative argument from higher order evidence, can also see what follows as an exercise. If HE star is to have the trumping power that the argument claims for it, then it ought to mandate significant confidence reduction and thus a low posterior probability for theism, even if the prob prior probability for theism is set high. Right, so if we want to find out how much, if at all, someone should reduce their confidence in light of uh, HE star, that is your confidence in theism, we need to know the probability of theism on HE star. Right? And we put the relevant propositions into Bayes' theorem, we get what you see on your hand up there. All right, so we've set the prior probability of theism at 0.9. That automatically gives us a prior probability of negation of theism of 0.1. To determine the probability of theism on HE star, we need two other things, two independent factors. We need the probability of HE star on theism and the probability of HE star on the negation of theism. In other words, we need to know how likely it is that we have all this higher order evidence if theism were true, and we need to know how likely it is that we have this higher order evidence if theism were false. If it turns out that it's more likely that we have this higher order evidence on the negation of theism than it is uh, on theism, then the higher order evidence will tend to disconfirm theistic belief. The extent of disconfirmation will depend on the values themselves. But this is kind of headed toward the first substantive point. Determining the values is itself a substantive matter. It's not a mere formality. So there's already reason to be suspicious of a universal answer to the question, what attitude one should take toward theism in light of H.E. Star. 
And if things are already somewhat up in the air with respect to this, then we should be suspicious of the idea that higher order evidence like AG star dissolves the warrant of all the beliefs it comes into contact with. Uh, maybe the best way to proceed here is just to plug in what seem like some sensible values and see what we can learn from this exercise. So again, people who don't like the values are free to plug in their own. And I should maybe say here, grumbling about the values will in a way support one of the main points I want to make. Um, that point is that these are substantive issues rather than formal ones. Um, so start with the probability of HE star on theism. How likely is it that we find all the higher order evidence in HE star if theism were false? It wouldn't be all that surprising to find evidence like HE star if theism were false. For given the falsehood of theism, we might still expect people to ponder the existence of God, to form beliefs about the matter, and to disagree with each other. We might well expect, once reflection got going, uh, for evidence like HE star to accumulate. At any rate, this isn't particularly improbable on the negation of theism. Of course, it's not particularly probable either. It's not like the mere negation of theism leads us positively to expect all of this high order evidence. So, accordingly and provisionally, let's assign the probability of HE star on theism a value of 0.5. Next, consider the probability of HE star on theism. In determining this value, we're asking, how likely is it on theism that there would be all manner of doubt and confusion about whether God exists? How likely is it that many apparently good-willed, intelligent people would have such difficulty figuring out whether there's a God? How likely is it that there would be widespread disagreement over God's existence, and that both beliefs and evidence related to the matter would be distributed by highly contingent factors? Some philosophers, those who advocate atheistic arguments from divine hiddenness, have argued that this probability is very low. If theism were true, its truth would likely be clear to all goodwilled, intelligent persons. But as above, this is a substantive issue, one whose resolution is by no means straightforward. So for uh, illustrative purposes, suppose the probability of HE star on theism is something like 0.05. In that case, the probability of theism on HE star can be calculated, uh, as you see on your handout there. It's going to result in a probability uh, of HE star on theism of something a little bit less than a half. Given these values, HE star mandates significant confidence reduction in theism. Likewise, if we keep the, uh, keep the other values constant but assign HE star on T a value of 0 0.01, an even lower value, then our final value for theism on HE star would be about 0.15. Again, resulting in significantly reduced confidence uh, in theism, or at any rate, significantly reduced rational credence for theism. Clearly then, one who believes theism, or places a high rational credence in theism, can find himself in a bad epistemic position upon learning of HE star. But crucially, the probability assignments needed to generate that result are themselves controversial. They require taking up positions with respect to such matters as how likely H.E. star would be on theism. And if this is right, we can draw an important lesson. What judgments we are rational in making about the epistemic significance of H.E. star with respect to theism doesn't float free of our judgments about other topics, for instance, divine hiddenness. Rather, the significance of H.E. star depends on one's getting grounds for thinking the probability of HE star on theism is low. And if so, then the skeptic who wishes to defend the cumulative argument from higher order evidence will need to descend into the fray and argue that divine hiddenness and the like is unlikely on theism. For notice, if the probability of HE star on, on theism is 0.5, then given the value of 0.5 for HE star on the negation of theism, then finding HE star will neither confirm nor disconfirm theistic belief. And it's hard to imagine the theist agreeing to a very low value for the probability of HE star on theism without a fight. So our first lesson is that this higher order evidence's effect on theism depends on substantive matters. In particular, it depends on the comparative probability of our higher order evidence on theism and its negation, respectively. And of course, similar arguments apply to other religious beliefs. A second lesson is this. The content of religious belief is relevant to its ability to withstand H.E. star. Perhaps surprisingly, some specific versions of theism seem to bear far better 
than bare theism uh, in this respect. So consider Christianity. This view includes theism, but adds that we humans are mired in sin, and that this sin has impaired not only our moral standing before God, but also our cognitive capacities for knowing God. Thus, in speaking of mankind, St. Paul says, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. That's from Romans chapter 1. Apart from God, according to the Christian story, we are lost both morally and noetically. Fortunately, in his grace and through the sacrifice of his son, God has arranged for both our moral and cognitive redemption. But, uh, back to the bad news, even the believer should expect unclarity about God's nature and purposes. To quote Paul again, we see things as through a glass darkly, at least in this slide. So, sorry to be giving all this bad news on Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so let C designate Christianity so described. As it turns out, H.E. Star has less disconfirming power with respect to C, with respect to Christianity, than with respect to theism. This is because the probability of H.E. Star on Christianity is higher than the probability of H.E. Star on theism. In other words, Christianity gives us more reason to expect H.E. Star than does uh, bare theism. Further, it seems that H.E. Star is about what we'd expect given Christianity. For as noted above, Christianity gives a strong reason to think that when it comes to reasoning about God, humans will make all kinds of mistakes, will manufacture all kinds of misleading evidence, and so on. So as not to overstate the case, let's assign a probability of 0.75 to uh, that of H.E. star on theism. If we do this and assume a prior probability for Christianity of 0.9, then it won't much matter uh, we plug in for the probability of H.E. star on negation of Christianity. So even if we plug in a really high value, 0.9999, um, the effect of HE star turns out to be fairly negligible. Uh, as you see, it turns out to result in a probability uh, of Christianity on HE star of about 0.87. Further, if the probability of HE star on the negation of theism is less than 0.75 we assign for the probability of HE star on Christianity, uh, sorry, let me say it again. The probability of HE star on not C is less than 0.75 we assign for the probability of HE star on C, then acquiring HE star will actually confirm Christian belief. To put it mildly, that would be a surprising feature for a body of evidence touted as a universal defeater for religious beliefs. Alright, so I'm about to wrap up just some concluding remarks. It bears repeating that the values assigned above are assigned primarily for the purpose of illustration. If we change them, we're going to get different results. For instance, if we set the priors for theism or Christianity lower, this can make those beliefs easier to defeat than they'd otherwise be. And if we set those priors higher, the beliefs will be harder to defeat or disconfirm. Likewise, the defeating effects of HE star depend in part on the extent to which our religious beliefs lead us to expect such higher order evidence. And as we've seen, Christians have better reason to expect such evidence than proponents of bare theism. One should think that uh, this comparative claim is right, even if one balks at the value assigned the probability of HE star on theism. All right, so where does all this leave us? First, given the sheer number of factors involved, I think it should leave us in doubt about the key premise of the cumulative argument for higher, from higher order evidence. So recall that premise. It says, if S is justified in believing P on grounds G and comes aware of this evidence HE star, uh, then that subject isn't justified in believing P. We've now seen that discovering HG star doesn't automatically result in epistemically mandatory and significant reduction in confidence. Much depends on whether HG star uh, would be expected on the target belief and whether it would be expected otherwise. Second, in many ways, our discussion of the cumulative argument from higher order evidence points away from itself. It encourages skeptics to reconsider granting that religious beliefs have strong prima facie support. So maybe they ought to not do that anymore. Uh, further, it forces religious skeptics who wish to argue from higher order evidence to consider the related issue of divine hiddenness. Both of these are the opposite of mere formality. Um, the argument also encourages believers to consider employing conceptual resources, including Christian resources, that extend beyond their theism. Such strategies may reveal that their actual beliefs are disconfirmed by H.E. star to a lesser extent 
and particular subsets of their beliefs. Finally, the argument forces the religious believer to consider whether the beliefs really do enjoy strong prima facie support. In its connection, we'll note one final problem. There's at least a certain tension between, on the one hand, warding off the negative effects of higher order evidence by appeal to the Christian story about humanity's noetic flaws, right, that on the one hand, and on the other hand, insisting that there are epistemic grounds for believing that Christian story in the first place. If Christianity leads us to expect all kinds of cognitive frailty and failing, why think the prima facie grounds for belief are so strong? This is a problem that the Christian philosopher needs to work to resolve. More generally, it appears that if any of us wants a definitive solution to the uh, problem of higher order evidence, we'll need to get back to work on other topics. That's not very nice. We're fortunate to have a comment today from Charles Lassiter of the philosophy department here at Gonzaga. Uh, Dr. Lassiter uh, also does work in religious epistemology and uh, I found out that they, uh, our two speakers knew of each other but hadn't met until today, so it's nice to have them uh, working together here. Thanks. Um, so thanks for the invitation to, uh, to, to speak to the Socratic Club and for an opportunity to respond to Nate's uh, excellent paper. Thanks for joining me. Absolutely. All right. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll just offer a uh, very quick overview of uh, what I think to be some of the key points of Nate's paper. Uh, I'll offer an argument on behalf of the religious uh, skeptic, and then and then uh, offer uh, another way to avoid the problem that uh, Nate initially the, the problem of higher order evidence that Nate uh, initially discusses. So Nate offers a collection of higher order, order evidence against religious belief. That evidence includes you know, HE one through five that you have on your sheet. Um, and that while each one of those singly may not make uh, much of a dent in one's uh, religious uh, in one's confidence, collectively they present pretty good reason to think that we are unjustified in our religious commitments. And so the argument Nate gives us is is if S is justified in believing P on grounds G and becomes aware of a G star, then S is not justified in believing P. Uh, many religious believers are justified in their religious beliefs on the basis of certain grounds and are aware of a G star. Something for which we can thank me, I'm sure. Uh, therefore, many religious believers are not justified in their religious beliefs. So, uh, after trying several options that to greater or lesser extents work, uh, or excuse me, that greater or lesser extents due to failure, Nate offers us analysis using uh, Bayes' theorem, asking, in, in, in essence, given HE star, how likely is it that uh, T is true, where T is there exists an omnipotent, omniscient, Holy good God who created the world. Now, one value that I think is, is particularly important that Nate also emphasized is that of the probability of HE star on T, which asks, how likely is it, if T is right, that there will be all manner of doubt and confusion about whether God exists? And so if we're working with a threadbare theism, we'll set that value relatively low. It's a 0.05, suggesting that it's terribly unlikely. But if we have a more sophisticated Theism, right? A theism that includes belief about divine hiddenness and our cognitive limitations in thinking about God. Then it's reasonable to increase the value of that to 0.75. Uh, because after all, Christianity gives us reason to think that you know human beings that were mired in sin and that are being mired in sin limits our capacities to know and understand God. So if Christianity were right, we expect that higher order evidence. So consequently, uh, Christian belief is justified even in light of defeaters like this body of higher order evidence. Now, an additional take home point that, uh, that I'll talk about uh, is that belief in T, right, belief that in the existence of an omnipotent, omniscient, holy good God, right, that doesn't float free from our other beliefs about God, right. So the epistemic force of that higher order evidence depends on grounds for thinking that the probability of HE star on T is low. So beliefs about divine hiddenness, as suggested uh, by Nate, motivate high values for the probability of HE star on C, uh, where C is Christianity, right? It's, it's sort of T plus you know, uh, beliefs about divine hiddenness in our cognitive limitations. So the first thing I want to do is talk about a worry I have about uh, HE star, the probability of HE star on T. 
So what I want to suggest here is that there is a bit of higher order evidence uh, that would make that would make uh, that, that would give us reason to set that value of he star on t relatively low. So, so Nate, uh, so Nate suggests that uh, that we could set that value relatively high at 0.75. And so what that says is that we have fairly good reason to think that given the truths of Christianity, there will in fact be all manner of doubt and confusion about, uh, about God. So C, right, this, uh, the collection of claims about Christianity, includes minimally propositions like God exists, and human cognizers are prone to mistakes in their thinking about God. So call that second one M, right, the, you know, that we are prone to make mistakes in our thinking about God. So what I want to suggest is that that commitment, right, the fact that we are prone to making mistakes in our thinking about God, I want to suggest that that's going to be ultimately problematic for the position that Dave is developing. Uh, and I want to make this case through an analogous case in, uh, in, in clinical psychology. So there are two kinds of treatment, or but broadly speaking, for our purposes, there are two kinds of uh, treatment for psychological illness. Right? So we can compare Freudian psychotherapy with cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, the aim of Freudian psychotherapy, uh, as the psychotherapists will tell you if you rank with them, uh, is that the goal is to identify unconscious psychodynamic structures underpinning mental illness. Once those mechanisms are identified, then work begins on deconstructing the mechanisms. <coughs> right? This happens by means of talking about whatever comes to mind, and the, in the, in the uh, psychoanalyst asks appropriate probing questions to help dismantle the structures. Now, a central principle of Freudian psychotherapy is that problems like anxiety and depression are only symptoms of a deeper conflict. And so treating psychological problems means getting at that deeper conflict, who, uh, getting at that deeper problem whose genesis is typically in earlier life experiences. So for example, a de patient's depression can emerge from conflicting feelings about love and sort of resentment of their parents. Now identifying this can often take years. And it's fairly straightforward for the Freudian psychotherapist why it would take years, right? Because these problems are so deeply embedded in the human psyche that it's going to take a lot of work to pull these things up. The cognitive behavioral therapist, on the other hand, identifies problematic patterns of behavior and in a sense trains the patient to follow different lines of thoughts when maladaptive beliefs and emotions arise. So for the cognitive behavioral therapist, the aim is to replace maladaptive and self-destructive thinking with realistic and effective thinking. So here's a quick example, right? So there's this case uh, about a woman in the UK who thought that she, who believed that she emitted an unpleasant odor. And so the, uh, and so her therapist, right, this cognitive behavioral therapist, told her to just get on the subway with an order of fried fish and French fries, right, so fish and chips, uh, and tell her to just observe the reactions of others that she was sitting nearby. So she did this, and she found that when she had the fish and chips, others were going you know, to sort of turning their noses and sort of trying to scoot away from her. And so this, according to the cognitive behavioral therapist, would you know, allow the woman to see that she wasn't emitting the bad odor. Because if she were, people would react to her uh, as they did when she had the vision chips. Now, uh, a key difference between Freudian psychotherapy and cognitive behavioral therapy is that cognitive behavioral therapy often works in a matter of weeks or months instead of years. Now, at, right, so, so there was actually a bit of an uh, argument about this recently, uh, I guess about five years ago, uh, when, uh, when the British government uh, dumped a whole bunch of money into cognitive behavioral therapy research. So a variety of psychotherapists got very upset about this, um, and cognitive behavioral therapists defended their position by saying that, uh, that their, that their, uh, that their uh, technique uh, has uh, advantages with speed, right, so weeks and months instead of years, and it is substantially more cost effective. Now, in defense, psych Freudian psychotherapists would say that we shouldn't expect easy fixes to deep rooted problems, right, because the problems are so deep rooted, we should actually expect that fixing them would take a long time, right, but here's the problem. This move insulates Freudian psychotherapy from empirical falsification. Every time there is evidence suggesting that cognitive behavioral therapy is superior to Freudian psychotherapy, the Freudian psychotherapist simply says, well, of course we would expect that. 
I mean, the problems are far deeper than the cognitive behavioral therapist would suggest or expect. And so as a result, I would suggest that we have reason to be suspicious of Freudian psychotherapy. Because it has built into it a kind of failsafe to insulate it against empirical falsification. That is, a way to so it has built into it a way to explain away potential defeaters by suggesting that the defeaters were actually anticipated. If the evidence doesn't go the, like the, the Freudian's way, the Freudian advocate is open to say, well, I'm not surprised, right? Getting at those deep rooted problems and those deep rooted mechanisms often leads to dead ends. It's something we expect. So I hope that the parallel with Nate's paper is, is somewhat clear at this point. One of the unattractive features of the Freudian, of Freudian psychotherapy is one of its main principles, that psychological problems are deep-rooted in the patient's psyche, and any attempt to show that the therapy is ineffective is met with a response that mirrors that of divine hiddenness. Of course we would expect failure. These are deep problems that are hard to get at. Right? So Freudian psychotherapy works in a clause that explains away these potential defeaters. In this case, uh, any purported disconfirming evidence. So I would suggest that a bit of higher order evidence that we could add to HE star is this. We could call this HE6. Whenever some system of thought works, works in a clause to preserve itself in case of falsification, we have reason to be skeptical of that system of thought. After all, we're working with a collection of ideas that can never be falsified. And so it's clear how HE6 is related to that principle M, the fact that we're prone to make mistakes in our reasoning about God. Right? M is just such an escape clause. But HE star with HE6 now give us good reason to set the probability of HE star on C, right? You know, how likely it is uh, that we would be wrong uh, about our beliefs about God given uh, Christianity. Um, we would that give us uh, HE6 gives us reason to set that rather low, right? Because uh, because it is, because it turns out to be one of these systems of thought that works in principles to protect itself against falsification, right? Which I would suggest opens up room for the religious skeptic. Um, okay, so so that's uh, so that's sort of the, my uh, uh, position on behalf of the religious skeptic. And so uh, do I have enough time to? Go yeah. Cool. Thanks. So, what I want to offer now is another reply to the skeptic that uh, that that Nate that Nate doesn't address, but might be fruitful for opening up conversation. So Nate says that theistic beliefs do not float free of our other beliefs, right? And that's that seems absolutely right. But I wonder, well, why stop there? A fruitful avenue of exploration is to consider something of a Quinean holism, right? So Quine, uh, you know. Uh, our beliefs are caught up in a web of other beliefs, and importantly, a web of other practices. So for example, if my experiment doesn't generate the results I expect, it just might be that I'm doing my experiment incorrectly. Right? So all of my beliefs may be right, but my practices may be, may be going astray. So. Now, for the view that it develops, it might be that theistic beliefs are connected with other beliefs as well as other practices. Consequently, our religious beliefs are epistemically, uh, as well as practically or prudentially justified. But instead of using practically justified, uh, I'm going to use the expression practice, uh, that they have practice-based justification as a way of distinguishing between justification of belief by their role and set of practices versus a kind of pragmatic or useful value of a belief. You know, so it might be so it might be practically useful, for, or it might be useful for me to believe that I can lose five pounds. Uh, but it may not be practice-based uh, justified, since it's not located within a larger web of belief practices. So even if epistemic justification gives out, we might have practice-based justification supporting our beliefs. So religious beliefs are justified by the roles that they play in our webs of beliefs and practices. Now, I want to suggest that this isn't so bad, right? So we can actually consider it an example from logic. So classical logic, as is well known, suffers from the awesomely named problem of explosion. So if you have any pair of inconsistent premises, that entails any proposition you want. Now, some folks have argued that this actually gives us reason to abandon some of the central tenets of classical logic or multi-value logic. Something like that. <laughs> now, consider some theorem of classical logic. Just you know, go ahead and pick your favorite, because everybody's got a favorite theorem, naturally. Uh, now, the proof of the theorem justifies that theorem, 
But the problem of explosion acts as a piece of higher order evidence against the truth of the theorem. After all, it's evidence suggesting that our logical system that's used for justifying theorems is somehow faulty. But even though we have this higher order epistemic evidence against the belief in the theorem, belief in the theorem should be justified because it's caught up in a web of practices as well as a web of beliefs. We live and act in large part in ways that validate for ourselves a large number of the rules of classical logic. So, practice-based justification is caught up in a web uh, of belief, or uh, uh, with epistemic justification, or as part of that of our web of belief, the way the web of belief is structured. And higher order evidence undermining the latter, undermining epistemic justification, doesn't obviously undermine practice-based justification. But practice-based justification is, prima facie, part of rational endorsement of some belief. Consequently, practice-based justification is sufficient for endorsement of some belief. That is to say that because this belief is caught up in our web of other beliefs and other practices, even if we have higher order evidence against other beliefs within our web of beliefs, we could still uh, epistemically, or we could still rationally endorse our religious beliefs on the basis uh, of their being caught up with other practices in which we are engaged. So even if epistemic justification is unavailable for theistic beliefs, one might appeal to practice-based justification as a way to justify those beliefs. So in a nutshell, there's more to what we, uh, there might be more to what we religiously believe than simply what we rationally endorse. Thank you. Nate, do you want to say a couple of words about that uh, comment? Uh, so I've got a couple of thoughts. So uh, I'll, I'll go through these quickly, and I really want to get the discussion going. Uh, so first, great comments. Uh, I think Charlie's pressing a really important objection, even an entertaining objection, um, but above <laughs> all, uh, one that I hadn't thought of, thought of before that I want to think more about. Um, just initially, a couple of thoughts. Uh, so. These address the worry that in setting the probability of HE star on Christianity high, um, you know, St. Paul and friends are making the view unfalsifiable. They're adding this kind of ad hoc epicycle um, that makes them subject to uh, suspicion. So first, I want to ask, um, is Paul making our epistemic capacities look bad just in order to accommodate higher order evidence like HG star. Um, if he is, then it looks like what he's doing is ad hoc, uh, and we should be quite suspicious. And by the way, if you, if you end up assimilating Paul to the Freudians and convincing me of that, I'll, I'll say uncle. <laughs> uh, but uh, if that's not what Paul's doing, um, it might be that the expectation of HG star is more deeply ingressed within the Christian belief system than ad hoc additions typically are. Um, and just in looking at, uh, say, the book of Romans, I don't see anything that indicates that Paul's purpose is to accommodate something like H.G. E. Star. Um, you know, so again, to appeal to another scientist, it's not like he's adding epicycles in to explain odd orbits that were just uh, discovered. Um, he's telling the story of our fall, uh, of God's wrath, and our redemption. Um, and the bit about our cognitive frailties stems from the story about our moral frailties. So it looks like it's um, independently motivated, uh, motivated not just in such a way as to account for our aging star. Um, second, quick point, um, does the inclusion of an error clause make a resulting belief system unfalsifiable? Um, well, certainly if a belief system includes an error clause for every potential bit of disconfirming evidence, then it looks like that's what's going on. And that, of course, looks very suspicious. Um, but I'm not sure that classical Christianity um, is doing quite that. So after all, classical Christianity doesn't contain out clauses for such potential defeaters as you know, blatant contradictions uh, with respect to the doctrine of the Trinity, or the discovery of Jesus' bones, or you know, the heat death of the universe before Christ returns, or something like that. <laughs> Uh, maybe that last one was a little easier. Um, so, I mean, on the one hand, I share this caution, and Charlie's quite right to caution, um, that if Christianity accommodates H.E. Star in this really ad hoc way, um, then it's going to be in trouble. 
Um, but if it doesn't do that, then, then maybe not. So more to talk about there. Um, I'll sort of leave it at that. Um, I'll add only that, um, right, given that I think Christianity is true, I ought to think that my cognitive faculties are frail, so I might have missed something. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, let's, yeah, let's talk. Um, this is, uh, I think it's next. Um, but it might be touching on uh, these yeah. uh, comments. Um, the, I think at the end of the paper where you compare Christianity, Christian theism versus spirit theism, and how it's a little bit more resistant to the arguments from how it um, the, the resistance might be at least a little bit less apparent insofar as the initial probability that you have for both theism and Christian theism is the same. Yeah. But Christian theism is more specific yeah, than yeah. theism. Yeah. And so it should always be a little lower than the general plan. And so even though it may be more resistant, um, because its initial probability is lower, um, and as the more specific that you get, right, yeah, yeah. Um, that it's going to not move as much in light of the higher order evidence, but it might be closer to skepticism. So cool. yeah, yeah. Good. At the outset. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, this, uh, this is something that I, I've worried about. I mean, one thing, when we're just trying to figure out the disconfirming power, um, it helps to set those factors as equal. Now, you're right. In any given case, um, the, the prior for theism might probably ought to be higher than the prior for Christianity. Um, but given that we're just isolating the disconfirming power itself, um, I propose set them equal and just think about two different people. So I mean, I think I think the worry that you're onto might remain for some individual believer. Um, but the point I'm trying to make um, concerns the disconfirming power itself. Yeah. So, so I, I mean, I think you're honest. Yeah. So it strikes me that 
then you're kind of reverting to your practice-based justifications. Right? Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so then, what struck me about that is that when you say some of our beliefs might be practice-based justified rather than rationally yeah, it's justified, sort of, I can't remember how you describe yeah, it. Yeah, sort of epistemically justified. Yeah. The, the difficulty there is that the practice-based justification is justified based upon our interpretation of the practice, right? So when I have an experience or when I participate in a particular practice that embodies my belief, um, and that makes sense in the level of my context and, and the level of my life experiences and all that, it does so because I'm understanding it in a particular way. Right. I, I mean, I'm not sure that you could just say, well, there's practice-based justifications that are separate from the, the rational based justifications because all those practice based justifications are justifications because they mean something to us and they mean something to us because we've interpreted them right i agree with that i mean i, I suppose that's that's one of the sort of underlying ideas that when i when i describe these things as part of a web of belief right the fact that they are all interconnected so so i would agree with that yeah so i guess i I'm confused then on how okay. you're responding to the student because you're, it seems like you're just responding to the student by saying, well, um, just remember that you've had other experiences and you should develop, you know, you should take those into consideration too. But their concern, their question is not, should I pay attention to my other experiences? Their question is, how should I think about my other experiences in light of H U star? Okay, I'm sorry, I misunderstood your question there. Um, should should I do I have to, like I've been a believer all my life I've gone to church I you know believe this way my whole other context seems to be falling apart on me because now I question okay. whether I've been understanding reality correctly because of ancient stuff. Right, right, okay. So the worry then is that in light of this higher order evidence, it's not simply that it's, it's not that the higher order evidence calls into question. Uh, those beliefs with our step, those beliefs with epistemic justification, but also sort of it throws everything into question. Right? That that even those, so even our, so not right, so our ways of acting and thinking about the world of themselves. Call into question. So I'm curious uh, as to how a, a skeptic who might be more um, aligned with the, not the cumulative argument, but just sort of the basic 
argument from disagreement, just starting out with um, understanding that presumably there are people who are just as smart as us and well-meaning, well-learned, etc. And so presuming that in that case, we're equally likely to get at the truth if we're given the same body of evidence, etc. Um, and so to stick with my own view at the end of the day would be um, arbitrary. And um, so I'm curious as to a skeptic who believes in that sort of argument um, would respond to your cumulative response, or the response to the cumulative argument. When you say that, we can explain the disagreement with this error clause. Um, and whether you agree, whether you would say that um, to the skeptic, that might just amount to denying purehood by saying that um, the people who disagree with us are because they're mired in sin, um, their cognitive faculties are you know, not ideal, etc. Whether that amounts to, for the skeptic, giving this basic argument for disagreement, is just saying that, well, I'm going to deny that you're my epistemic equal, that uh -huh. in either um, cognitively or evidentially, that you're my epistemic inferior. Uh -huh. But to the skeptic, that is the exact type of pressure that he or she wants to put on the religious believer. So it almost seems to be consistent with them, but just changing the wording from epistemic inferiors to mired in sin or something like that. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, so the way the argument typically gets going is with the assumption that the two parties are, are epistemic peers. Um, and uh, I suppose it's right that, at least initially I suppose it's right, that uh, if you think that all of us are mired in sin unless our cognitive faculties are restored, then uh, yeah, you might be committed to the idea that some people are, are more reliable with respect to assessing their own evidence than others. Um, that'll lead to a good denial of purehood. Um, but I would suggest that a belief in, in the purehood premise is highly questionable in any case. Um, the thought that we've got the same evidence, uh, you know, roughly equal degrees of reliability for assessing evidence, uh, that's questionable in any case. And certainly when we move to the kind of higher level of our grounds for thinking that others have the same evidence we have and are equally reliable. Um, those grounds are going to be harder to come by. So uh, I guess the short answer is uh, I'm inclined to deny the peers' premise in any case. Um, and I think you're, you're pressing on an important issue. Well, maybe it's not uh, are we peers, but right, why think why think you're better than I or something like that? Um, that'd be a way to reformulate the kind of skeptical arguments. Um, that's now a third argument independent of the peer space and the uh, worth discussing. I'm not sure to say about it at this stage. I'd like to put pressure in the same place I think Charlie was. You use tenets of Christian doctrine to justify why it's more likely if the if the Christian theism is true that there will be higher or <coughs> existence of higher order evidence yeah. against it. But then there are some other tenets of Christianity that may be used to justify why that wouldn't be the case. So for example, often Christians take God to be someone who is just, who is fair in his dissemination of revelation, whether for general revelation or special. The fact that God is considered to be a loving God and theoretically wants to have this relationship with his people. Also, he's all powerful. I mean, these seem to be tenets of Christianity that would indicate that given his presence, there would be a reduced amount of higher evidence, given he wouldn't want that to be present for a, a reason, or through other ways would allow himself to be known by more people. I think this reflects a common struggle with many people in general. What happens to people who haven't been given the same you know, blessed opportunity I have to happen to have been born in a place where I get to know the truth? Yeah. So, what do you do with tenets of Christianity like that? Does that somehow reduce the likelihood of higher evidence? Yeah, no, that's a great point. Uh, it might. Uh, I'd have to think about that in greater detail. Um, I guess, uh, you know, by way of initial response, you know, when I think of the saints who've struggled with divine goodness, the most John of the Cross. That um, I see them affirming those same tenets. Um, God is just. God loves everyone. God wants to uh, come into relationship with 
for the people. And I also see them affirming all this higher order evidence. Well, it's a mess, right? Cognitively, we're blind. Um, so what the Christian's going to want to look for is some way to, to reconcile those two things. Um, I don't know how to do that uh, right now. I think it's a good, it's a good project. Uh, but I'm not sure how to do it. Uh, that can be done, I guess, and committed to the Christianity that does affect those things. But how would I have done it? Um, I mean, it might even depend on an individual. Who knows what God's reasons are for allowing John the cross to endure. Things. Another thing a Christian might say is that there are other features of our, of our world, features God is uh, not happy or there that contribute to his illness. Features that maybe stem from our freedom and our use of. No, it's a great question. It deserves more by way of response than it is. Maybe one more question. Last uh, chance here. Nathan, I have one question that relates back back to your ad hoc comment. Isn't it the case that uh, another way to defend human fallenness uh, is to um, is to suggest that it's supported by independent evidence, namely how it resonates with our own experience of ourselves and of other human beings? I wonder, does that undermine again the ad hoc character that would avoid the kinds of objections that Charlie was raising. So it's not ad hoc because we expect it. Well, not really because we expected it. I mean, if, if there were other ways that we could confirm Freudianism, let's say, right? And you think about the funding dispute that you were sketching out for us, Charlie. The Freudian would be wise not to say, oh, we anticipated all these objections, but, but rather to, to appeal to this independent body